here. Very good. Okay, um, so yeah, let me quickly introduce our speaker and then you all don't have to listen to me anymore and can actually hear the interesting talk you came here to attend. Um, so yeah, our speaker this month is Seth for Privacy. Seth for Privacy is the head of content for Foundation, a Bitcoin-centric sovereign computing company, as well as a privacy advocate and host of the Opt Out podcast, a podcast focused on helping others take actionable steps toward improving their personal privacy. Um, and to give a lead in for Seth here about what he's going to be talking to us about, um, ever wondered what the best tool available for financial sovereignty is today? Many would posit Bitcoin as the ultimate solution, but Monero has emerged as a vital and important tool for freedom and the absence of easy to use and approachable privacy tools for Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, newsflash, uh, Bitcoin may be semi-anonymous, it is not private. <laughs> so we're going to dive into what Monero is why we need it, and how it takes a holistic approach to protecting each and every user. And uh, without further ado, take it away, Seth. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin. Just want to double check. Hear me okay? See my slides okay? Everybody um, a little low? Let me, I got a wall thing here. Uh, speak again, Seth. Check, 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 check. Okay, that's, hmm, we do not have sound coming through on the HDMI. It's my rinky-dink laptop. That's not <laughs> That'll do it. All right. Well, I've got maybe hmm, you may just have to speak up a little bit. Yeah, let me turn up my gain a little bit. Let me know yeah, if I'm this, clipping. This but... volume knob is not doing anything, and I'm up all the way. Yeah, change the. There you go. Oh, you're... speak now. Check, 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 check. check oh, there check. we go. There we go. <laughs> I tip my yeah. <laughs> We have smart friends. Ugh, great. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we should be good on sound there. Very good. All right. Uh, take away, Seth. <laughs> awesome. Well, first off, just want to welcome you all. I'm really excited to give this presentation. Uh, I've, if anyone has followed me or has heard kind of what I what I talk about, community is really the biggest focus for me. Um, and whenever I talk about privacy, community is the first step that I recommend people take to be able to improve their personal privacy. Because uh, it really is when we have people around us, like you all uh, at your meetup, um, that we're able to both learn the tools, we're able to use them effectively, they're able to, to help each other, um, and they're able to get through just the the mental and, and psychological strain that can come with starting to realize uh, some of the, the surveillance society that we live in. Um, so applaud each and every one of you for coming out and participating in uh, this EFF Austin meetup. Uh, I'm really excited to to chat with you all today. Um, a thanks to to Kevin and a friend of mine, Nate in Austin, who set this up. Um, always love the opportunity to talk financial freedom and specifically to talk about Monero, which is is really near to, near and dear to my heart, um, and is ultimately how I actually got into the the privacy space. How I started to care about my personal privacy, why I started doing education. Uh, it all really stems from my participation in the Monero community. Um, and today we'll just kind of walk through what Monero is and, and how it can be a tool for financial freedom. A very brief outline, um, I'll be walking through just simply financial privacy is the root of human rights. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep into that. I'm going to go as, as philosophical, but a little bit more, more practical and technical today. Touch on the war on financial privacy and specifically some of the, the cases that we've been seeing over the last year um, and how we, we need alternatives to the, the existing banking system, the existing digital currency system, um, to the, the coming central bank digital currencies, all that fun stuff. We'll take a very brief look at the history of Monero, uh, and then the bulk of the time today, we'll, we'll chat about how Monero creates uncensorable transactions and unstoppable mining, um, with most of that really focused on the transactions, since that's that's one of the bigger differentiators, especially for people who just want to use Monero as a tool. Um, and then lastly, just seeing how Monero can fit into your toolkit, whether or not you use Bitcoin today or something like it. Ultimately, what I want to want you to take away from this is, is having all of the information you need to make a, a well-informed decision about what tool you want to use when maybe your life is in the line, maybe when you want to make, make, a, make a recommendation to a political dissident, a journalist, um, or if, if things go south here in America, if you need it for yourself as well. Oops. Uh, another very quick slide, uh, just a short intro. Kevin went over pretty much all of this, um, but I've been working in the, in the Monero space for the past few years, really as a an educator, building out guides, simplifying tool sets for people to run their own Monero node, that sort of thing. Um, and he touched on the rest, so we won't spend any more time on on me. That's the boring stuff. 
if you've taken a look at Eric Hughes' writing, uh, specifically a cypherpunk's manifesto, um, you'll really understand a lot of the the place that I'm coming from when I approach Monero, because uh, it, it really outlines and was incredibly prescient both uh, the issues that we would face and what we would need in order to have a free society. Um, and when we look at his writings on uh, anonymous transaction systems, as he called them, and this was in the 90s, well before Bitcoin, well before Monero, well before any of this, um, but he understood that the basis of freedom is in having a tool that we can make transactions without exposing those details to other people, without having to tie our identity to them. Um, without having to involve a third party. Um, so he really saw the need before there was a solution. Um, but I would argue that there, there now actually is a solution. Um, but he saw that in order to remain free in this digital age, we need digital cash. Um, obviously, physical cash is a great tool for privacy. Um, it's one that I initially hated, uh, just isn't really part of my generation. But the more I started to understand about privacy, the more interested in using cash I became and and started to understand why some of like the older generation is more kind of cash friendly. Um, but obviously you can't use cash for all commerce these days. A lot of places are now not even accepting cash for payments. If you want to go on Amazon or something like that, most people aren't going to mail an envelope full of cash to amazon.com to, to get a, get a, a cast iron pan shipped to their door or something. So obviously cash isn't the end all be all for financial privacy. Um, and even where we can use cash, governments are quickly reducing our ability to do that. We've seen the EU rapidly reducing the limits on how we can spend cash, how much we can spend, uh, how much we can withdraw. We've seen measures in the US rapidly bringing limits down and down and down um, on how much we withdraw when we make transactions, what we have to report. Uh, we're, we're quickly seeing that governments understand that if they can control money, they can ultimately control their citizenry. Um, and so because of that, they're phasing out cash uh, and they're they're trying to make it so that we don't have a way to transact anonymously. Um, I think many in government are um, not malicious, but they think that there are advantages for um, society that ultimately will be harm when we strip privacy out of our financial system. Um, so ultimately, without a way to transact privately or anonymously, really the rest of our rights and freedoms rapidly break down. There's not really a lot we can do if we can't eat, we can't pay for gas, if we can't fund the causes that we want to fund. Um, everything else falls apart pretty quickly. Um, so so ultimately, financial freedom is a, a key and, and underlies each part of, uh, of our rights and, and our freedoms. Now, when we look at the last year, uh, we've seen some really good examples of good in the sense of uh, clear <laughs> examples of the risks when financial privacy is stripped away. Um, the first one of these that I wanted to touch on, uh, you may not have heard of as much, especially if you're not in kind of the, the Bitcoin scene. Um, it was definitely fairly popular across the news, but um, politics aside, there was a group protesting in Canada. Um, and while they were protesting, their bank accounts got shut down um, and they were unable to, to pay for gas, to pay for food, et cetera. Um, Bitcoiners tried to raise Bitcoin and donate it to be able to enable them to continue protesting. Um, but unfortunately, similarly to how the fiat failed them, even though they were able to collect the Bitcoin donations, they were able to give some of the Bitcoin donations to the truckers in this, this protest. Most of the truckers were unable to do anything with the funds. Many of them, when they tried to actually swap them for Canadian dollars, uh, the funds were confiscated immediately. Ultimately, Bitcoin didn't work very well because the Canadian government was actively tracing the funds as they were being given out and as they were being used. Um, funnily enough, it was the the Mounties that actually do the, the blockchain analysis for the Canadian government. No idea how they landed on that one, but they were the ones who were actually monitoring this. Um, and they were able to strip away the financial freedom of these protesters first through just the regular fiat banking system, and then to even prevent them from using Bitcoin as a tool for this because of a lack of privacy. Um, it was a really good chance for us to see how effective Bitcoin could be in an adversarial environment. Uh, and we hadn't really seen too much of that. Um, so this was, a, I think, a very telling example of how a lack of privacy can harm even tools that are decentralized at their nature. Because ultimately, when you have to interact with the rest of the world and you have to get outside of the digital world, that lack of privacy causes a lot of problems. Um, more generally, we've seen China obviously is is on the leading edge of, of how to wield financial control to control their citizens. Um, we've seen a few examples of this. Uh, there was a, a really 
I think, interesting one that we saw um, earlier in 2022, where people had been unable to withdraw funds from their bank. Uh, they tried to go and protest the the seizing of withdrawals or the, the prevention of withdrawals. When they tried to actually buy train tickets to go protest together, the Chinese government leveraged their COVID tracking system specifically to block them from being able to purchase train tickets so that they couldn't actually physically organize and protest. Um, so that one was uh, was financial. They wielded a separate system, but they ultimately used it to block them from being able to purchase transportation and, and make them unable to actually physically protest, um, which is another, I think, clear indicator of how stripping away financial freedom can quickly remove any real sort of um, uh, democracy or ability to, to protest or push back on, on governments. The third and uh, a really unique case that we've recently seen um, was the one of tornado cash in the U.S. Uh, we saw at the end of this year, the U.S. Treasury actually sanctioned not only specific actors, uh, which they've been sanctioning different cryptocurrency addresses for quite a while, specifically like North Korean hackers, that kind of thing. Um, but instead of just censoring specific addresses of a specific entity, the U.S. Treasury actually went after an entire privacy tool on the Ethereum blockchain called Tornado Cash. And they made it so that anyone interacting with that smart contract on Ethereum would be breaking sanctions laws. They made it so that anyone who withdrew funds from it, sent funds to it, um, even if they had funds locked in it at that point, the only way to get your funds out legally was to go through this strange kind of approval process with the US Treasury and prove to them why you should be allowed to do it. Um, and ultimately, they didn't just go after the tool itself, but they also went after the developers of the privacy tool. Um, I think this is the first clear instance we've seen of a, a tool for privacy being directly targeted by a government. And this was the US government specifically who went after them. Um, they put pressure on their allies in Amsterdam to actually arrest one of the devs for uh, Tornado Cash, who has continued to be held without charges um, since that point. Uh, and that's been four months now, uh, maybe even more than that. Um, so I think that one stands out to me as a good example of governments wanting to push back on tools that allow financial privacy and trying to prevent their usage. The interesting thing there is that even though sanctions were put in place, anyone who had an Ethereum full node actually could use Tornado Cash and could continue to gain privacy through it. Obviously, they'd be ranking sanctions. I'm not recommending that. But there, there was still the decentralized factor that made it possible to use that tool. And then lastly, really, there are just a growing number of cases. As governments understand what financial privacy and financial freedom means for the ability of their citizenry to push back, to stand for their own rights, um, they're starting to understand that if they can crack down on that, they can put pressure on us and ultimately control how we vote, uh, how we live, and, and ultimately grant themselves more and more power. So what tools do we have to work around this today? Um, obviously, I touched on cash earlier. Um, it's private. It's censorship resistant. No one else can see what you're making a, a trade for, what you're buying, what you're selling. Um, it's it's peer-to-peer. -peer. It's a, a really effective tool. Um, but obviously, it's hard to transact over distance. If you want to do cash by mail, it's a, a painful and risky process. It's not fun. Uh, <laughs> I've done it. Um, so it, it works, but it's being phased out. It's hard to do over distance, obviously. Now, when we look at Bitcoin, it does provide very strong self-sovereignty. But the ability for you to, to really gain that self-sovereignty, for you to be empowered, can suffer, especially in adversarial environments, can suffer because of the, the fungibility, the privacy, and censorship issues because of that default transparency. Um, and ultimately, you can use it privately. I mean, uh, a lot of what I've done is is using and explaining and educating on the privacy tools within Bitcoin. They are useful. They do work well, but they are quite difficult to use. There's a, a massive learning curve getting into them. Um, and even those who understand the tools properly can easily make mistakes and ultimately shoot themselves in the foot and harm their privacy. Um, so it can be a powerful tool, but it's a very difficult one for most people to actually use to its fullest. Now, Monero, on the other hand, it, it brings that strong self-sovereignty. It brings this decentralization, peer-to-peer, -peer, all of these things from Bitcoin, but it also solves the core privacy issues through strong default privacy. Within Monero, every transaction has strong privacy for the receiver, the sender, and the amount. Um, and we'll break, it, break down how that works 
specifically, um, but it's a it's a holistic approach to privacy for every person who uses it, no matter how smart, no matter how tech savvy, no matter how non-tech savvy grandma picks up a Monero wallet and starts to use it, she gains strong financial privacy. Um, and ultimately, Monero is built from the ground up for adversarial environments, which is is really what you need out of a privacy tool, out of a tool that's that's aiming at giving you freedom. So very simply, what do you want to use when you need to make a payment that someone doesn't want you to make, that someone wants to prevent? Um, and ultimately, I think that Monero is made for this. Um, it obviously has unique approaches that it's taken compared to Bitcoin and thus unique trade-offs. Um, most of those we won't get into today. They're more really semantic and personal preference. Um, I don't think most of them affect the majority of people, but um, I'm always happy to chat those afterwards with questions or um, directly one-on-one -on -one afterwards. But um, I do think it is a, a very easy to use tool and it's one that doesn't require you to know the ins and outs of how it works. I, I often compare it to Signal in that almost no one who uses Signal actually understands how the encryption mechanism works. No one understands the, the ratcheting key scheme. Um, no one really understands the details of that, and yet they're gaining all of the strong privacy that Signal provides by default. And Monero has a very similar approach. You can use it, you don't need to understand the details, and you can use it normally, just like someone would normally use Bitcoin, but you don't have to know all of these advanced privacy tools. You don't have to do coin control. You don't have to do all of these advanced manual things to be able to gain privacy. You just press send and you gain that strong privacy. So a very brief history of Monero. Um, Monero, unlike many other cryptocurrencies, actually is not just a Bitcoin fork. Um, it, it is created from its own unique protocol in 2014. Um, ultimately, it was forked off of another coin that unfortunately was a scam, but the actual technology behind it was fascinating and, and immensely useful. Um, and some, some people in the community understood the benefit that the actual technology could provide and essentially forked it away from scammers. Um, Kevin and I were talking a little bit before uh, before the meeting and talking about how many people see the the cryptocurrency space as as mostly a scam and I can't help but agree as someone who's been in the cryptocurrency space and works in the the Bitcoin space specifically um, the vast majority is is really a mess um, but Monero is one of those unique things that actually is built from the ground up not to profit not to benefit anyone except for those who want financial privacy and who want financial freedom um, so ultimately. It was created in 2014 out of a, a unique protocol that was different from Bitcoin that was is focused on decentralization and transactional privacy. Um, it underwent a massive upgrade in 2017, which hit amounts, which is the first time that had been done in a, a cryptocurrency up until that point. Um, and there have been big successive upgrades after that. One of the unique things about Monero compared to Bitcoin is that Bitcoin, we often say that it's ossified in that what it was a decade ago, it essentially is today. There's some changes, there's things being built on top of it, but the, the base layer, the base protocol isn't really changing that much. Um, but ultimately, Monero has taken great care to continue the core ethos it began with, which is digital cash that's accept accessible, private, and secure. Uh, another really good quote from the Cypherpunks Manifesto, I'm um, just talking about how transactional privacy really needs to include restricting the knowledge for both the parties in the transaction and parties outside of the transaction to the minimum possible. Um, and it really underlies how Monero approaches privacy. So when we look at Monero's actual approach to privacy, the way that it actually achieves this strong holistic privacy that I've been talking about, it really breaks down into three different approaches that work together to provide privacy for the receiver, the sender, and the amount in every transaction. Um, the first piece of this, this transactional protocol um, is something that's called one-time addresses. Uh, they also can be known as stealth addresses. If you're familiar with kind of the, the Bitcoin approach to privacy, stealth addresses were actually originally proposed for Bitcoin uh, way back in 2015. Um, but they are a, an approach where basically when you go to send a transaction, you take the the public key of the recipient of that transaction, a key exchange is performed, and you actually create a unique one-time address that is how you publish the transaction on chain, and only the receiver of that transaction knows that that address belongs to them. That address will never be reused. It can never be linked to another address cryptographically. 
um, and ultimately protects the recipient of every transaction by protecting their address. There's there's no kind of wallet clustering heuristics like there are in Bitcoin. There's no ability for you to to see that someone's reusing the same address like in Bitcoin. Um, there's no ability for you to trace funds back to the same wallet like in Bitcoin because addresses essentially don't exist in Monero because they are all one-time addresses that cannot be linked back to each other cryptographically. The second piece to Monero's approach to privacy is something called confidential amounts. Um, technically, the name for this is confidential transactions, but it, it doesn't really do a good job of describing what they are. Um, so basically, what confidential amounts are is they use pretty advanced cryptography um, to be able to hide the amounts within the transactions, but ensure that the transaction does not create Monero out of nowhere. Um, essentially, what we're wanting to do is to create a range proof that proves that the amount that you're sending minus the amount that's being received is not uh, creating funds out of nowhere, that funds are being sent to miners for the fee, uh, but that ultimately that that the math checks out without having to actually reveal that amount. Um, and that proof can be validated by miners, it can be validated by anyone who runs a node, um, and ultimately is a way to have amounts on chain without them being revealed to anyone except for the sender and the recipient of a transaction. Um, ultimately what this does is it completely prevents any kind of amount-based tracing, which when you look at Bitcoin's blockchain, uh, if for some reason you can't link addresses directly together, a lot of the ways that you'll link transactions is by using amount-based heuristics to look at the amounts being spent, um, to look at when someone's spending funds and, and tie them together based on the actual amounts that are used in those transactions. So because amounts are completely hidden in Monero, you can't do any of that. Um, it's completely impossible to actually see the amounts. Now, the last part of how Monero approaches privacy uh, is something, and this is uh, one of the more commonly known terms about Monero, something called ring signatures. Um, ultimately, what ring signatures are, are they're a way for the sender to pull fake inputs from the network to essentially query the Monero blockchain, pull 15 fake inputs that someone else received or spent at some point in time, combine them with their true input, and sign for the entire ring of those 16 inputs in a way that proves that one of them is true, is being spent, uh, has never been spent before, but without revealing which input is actually the true spender. Um, so what this does is it means that the sender of funds, even though they're sending funds directly to a recipient and that recipient knows things like the amount, they obviously know where they're receiving funds, they can't see uh, what the true spend is and they can't quickly trace back through to see the the previous history of um, of the sender's funds. Uh, so it provides strong sender privacy both against the other participant in the transaction and anyone who's trying to to view these things on chain and try to ascertain what's going on, where these funds are coming from, the past history of an input, because there's no way to statistically prove which input is the one being spent. And you'd have to trace all 16, go back and continue tracing who knows which one was the true input? Who knows which the true, true history is? Um, so it protects the sender right there. So when you look at this holistic approach, you get receiver privacy from one-time addresses, amount privacy from confidential amounts, and sender privacy from ring signatures. And these work together so that basically you just press send and you gain immense privacy guarantees. And because there's strong privacy, you gain censorship resistance. Ultimately, the, the protocol in Monero does all the work for you. You don't have to opt into using some fancy privacy tool. You don't have to opt in to, to understanding all the details of how this works. Uh, you wouldn't even need to hear this presentation to be able to use Monero in a privacy-preserving way. Uh, and that ultimately is one of the, the reasons why I love it as a tool for privacy. So... I added these in last minute, but I, I thought that they would be an, an interesting exercise to see a little bit of how transactions appear within the Bitcoin blockchain and the Monero blockchain. Um, for anyone who's familiar with Bitcoin, this probably won't be surprising for you. If you haven't ever looked at what a Bitcoin transaction looks like, uh, this will probably look very foreign to you, but I'll very briefly explain what's going on here. And I'll also explain, I, I literally pulled this up five minutes before we started, and I'll explain some data points that I was able to discover just by looking at this for two minutes while I pasted it into this, to the slides. Um, so when you look at this transaction, you can see that on the left side, there's an output right here. Oh, sorry. There's an output right here. You can see the address that's associated with it. That's the address that received those funds in the past. 
and then is now spending those funds. It's actually a public key that's derived from pri the private key of that the owner of that that input. Um, but you can see this BC one QK. That's the Bitcoin output that's being spent in this transaction. Two point five seven Bitcoin. You can see all the amounts, all transparent. Um, you can also very easily just click this address and start looking back to see what was the previous history of these funds. Can we see any other connected uh, outputs that the same user likely controls? Can we see where this came from? Did this come from an exchange? What We can easily dig back and see what information happened uh, with the sender previously. So sender does not have strong privacy here. When you look at the right side, you can see the two outputs. You can see one that again starts with this BC1Q that essentially denotes a a type of script that you're spending to. We won't dive into the details, but that's that's the most recent script type that you can spend to. And then you can also see this output, which is 396PH, starts with those, those letters in this public key. And you can see this is a very different type than the input or the other output. Um, and you can again see that the amounts completely transparent, completely visible, nothing hidden there. Now, just in like the, the two minutes of looking at this, um, I can already determine that the the 396 pH output is very likely the true spend here. That that's likely an amount being spent to someone else. Amount is being sent back to this entity as change. Um, and that's because when you send funds, wallets will prefer to send change to themselves back in the same script type that you sent them. And this is the most recent script type, so it's the cheapest to send. And then this one is a unique and older script type. So it's very likely this is actually the true spend. So now I can see. This is most likely the actual uh, person who's receiving these funds. I can start to look at their blockchain history. This is the amount that they received. So there's a lot of information I can glean in just two minutes of looking at this transaction. And everyone has access to this. If you have a browser, you can view all of this data on Bitcoin's chain. Now, when we look at Monero, it's a very different scenario. Um, hopefully, this isn't too small on your screen, but um, you know, hopefully, we can get at least get the basics across. So if you look at this, uh, this transaction, just like the Bitcoin transaction, only has one input and two outputs. The difference here is that when you look at the Monero transaction, you can see that this one input has 16 public keys associated with it. And so this is what I was talking about, about the ring signatures. So ultimately, one of these 16 keys is the true input that's being spent here. Uh, we don't know which. I can't tell you which. Um, if I had done some targeted attacks against this person, maybe I could get a better idea of which one is the true one. But from looking at the blockchain by itself, I have no idea which one of these is the true spend. Um, you can see that they're all drawn from different points in time, uh, and they're they're done in a way that, that tries to mimic the actual way that humans spend. You can see the amount shows up as zero. Essentially, what that means is just the amount is hidden. Um, because there was an amount field in the early Monero days, and the amount hiding was added on late, added on later. The amount field still exists, but it's just zero because it's completely hidden. On the output side, you can see there's two public keys. Uh, there's nothing distinguishable about these. They're one-time addresses. I can't tell what these are. There's there's no way to cryptographically link these to any other one-time addresses used on chain. Amounts are zero again. I can't tell the amounts that were spent here. None of this information is readily available. But this transaction is still 100% verifiable in a decentralized way. Uh, the sender and receiver still know the information that they need to verify this transaction is legitimate. Everything still checks out in the decentralization factor, but the privacy here is massively improved over the Bitcoin side. So shifting gears a little bit from the transaction privacy, um, I think that is probably the most important piece of Monero's approach. Uh, because it is the one that that most impacts the majority of people who are, are trying to use Monero as a tool for freedom. Um, but another aspect to Monero and something that, that matters with Bitcoin and any other decentralized currency is we need a way to be able to verify these transactions and to, to prove the history in a way that is decentralized. Um, ultimately, Bitcoin goes with a, a proof-of-work approach um, that is ASIC-friendly, and essentially an ASIC is just an application-specific integrated circuit. And that means that it's a, a, a chip that's built specifically for mining Bitcoin. Uh, you mine Bitcoin by computing SHA-256 hashes over and over again. Um, and so there's specific targeted hardware to mine Bitcoin with. The main downside to that is that, especially in the early days, it's gotten much better since then, especially in the early days, there were very few ASIC manufacturers. So there was a very much centralization in who made ASICs. 
all the ASICs initially were made in China. So China had 100% control over who would be able to mine because they could control the, the outflow of ASICs to the rest of the world. Um, and you have massive uh, mining farms essentially built up out of this by regulated companies that are are able to be pressured by governments, able to be pressured by um, nation states, and, and ultimately can be uh, used to censor Bitcoin transactions. There's a lot of details there, a lot of nuance there. Um, there have been cases of specific mining pools trying to censor transactions, but they've been very small, it hasn't been effective so far. Um, but I think it is something that we will eventually see on Bitcoin. Monero took a little bit different approach and, and actually more closely models what was laid out by Satoshi Nakamoto, the, the founder of Bitcoin in the white paper for Bitcoin, which is taking this approach of proof of work being one CPU, one vote. When we look at mining and cryptocurrencies, um, I know that there's there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, there's a lot of good points and uh, let's just say non-nuanced points when it comes to mining, both from the proof of work being good, proof of work being bad, proof of stake being good, proof of stake being bad, all of these different pieces. Uh, if we set that aside, the, the main advantage to proof of work is that it is very proven. It has been proven to be able to secure a blockchain um, against adversarial environments. It's also something that uh, makes it very easy for anyone to actually get in on securing a network and earning the native currency, um, especially when we look at Monero, which Monero has actually focused on being what's called ASIC resistant in that uh, some brilliant devs within Monero have built out a mining al algorithm where essentially your common CPU, the CPU in your laptop, CPU in your desktop, CPU in your phone are essentially an ASIC for Monero. We've, we've built this algorithm and by we, I don't mean me, but all the, the brilliant devs behind Monero have built this algorithm so that if you wanted to make a chip that was specifically built for mining Monero, and that was more efficient, you'd essentially have to beat out AMD and Intel at building CPUs, which is basically not going to happen and wouldn't be worth it. You'd be much better off just selling that CPU to the masses rather than trying to use it to mine Monero. So what that brings is that it brings a decentralization, both in manufacturing, you can buy a CPU from any manufacturer, you can buy any computer and it can mine Monero. Um, it brings decentralization in that you won't have these massive mining farms, uh, at least not to the same scale and it, it lowers the barrier to entry so that anyone can actually help to decentralize and secure the Monero network and to actually get Monero directly. Um, so one of the common problems with Bitcoin, Monero, et cetera, is depending on where you are, it may be hard to actually acquire cryptocurrencies in a way that doesn't require you giving over your ID. Um, but anyone can mine both Bitcoin and Monero directly. The, the difference is if you tried to mine Bitcoin on your computer, you'd basically just be wasting electricity. There's there's no chance statistically that you would actually earn any Bitcoin. Whereas if you started mining Monero with your desktop computer, especially, um, you actually can get rewards. You, you're not going to get rich overnight, but you can get Monero in exchange for electricity uh, and acquire it in a way that's untraceable, that's decentralized, and that comes straight to you. There's no middleman. Um, there's no one else handling those funds or able to see the details of those funds. Um, there's also an extra angle of decentralization for mining pools within Monero through something called P2 pool. Uh, won't dive too much into the details there, but essentially what that means is that we can have the lowered variance on when you get paid and how often you get paid like you would within a pool, but we can do it in a way that we actually use a second blockchain that's specific to P2 pool uh, that actually in a decentralized way handles payouts for miners um, and pays them out according to the amount of work they've done. Um, definitely outside the scope of this, but it's a really interesting new um, new approach to doing so. And it's something that I've been doing since the day that it came out for Monero. Uh, it's been fascinating. It's been a fascinating journey. It's been a very effective tool to help to decentralize Monero mining and ensure that even if, let's say, a nation state, let's say the U.S. Treasury decided to sanction Monero, and they said that mining Monero was illegal, but Monero was being used as an important tool for freedom within the U.S. How would we ensure that people could continue to actually mine it and thus process transactions, thus secure the history? It would be very difficult with Bitcoin because you'd have to be mining on this specially made, huge, electricity-hungry uh, machine for Bitcoin mining specifically. These companies, they wouldn't push back against a the sanction. They'd all go bankrupt or they'd sell their ASICs. Um, and so it'd be very difficult to continue to secure Bitcoin and thus actually make transactions within Bitcoin securely under that type of adversarial environment. Monero, on the other hand, 
while yes, in this scenario, you would be breaking sanctions laws, anyone who had a computer could very easily install one program and be mining Monero instantly. Uh, and it would make it very hard to actually enforce any type of ban. You can mine over Tor. Uh, you can do so, again, like I said, on any piece of hardware. So they can't just ban computers because if they ban computers, that would be a, a much more uh, a much more drastic move and something that, that couldn't really be done at this day and age. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a key for making sure that the network as a whole continues to operate even in this type of adversarial environment. So starting to kind of summarize and bring things back to the practical. Um, one of the ways that... As I've been working in Monero, as I've seen the adoption of Monero taking off over the past couple of years, one of the things that's really stood out about the, the things that Monero enables is the ability for people to really easily accept donations with just a static Monero address. You can take this static Monero address. It's it's a long string of characters. You can post it in your, your GitHub readme. You can post it in your Twitter bio. You can post it wherever you want, very simply. And anyone who wants to donate to you can do so in a privacy-preserving way, where even though you have that public key posted, I can't take that and go to a blockchain explorer and see any, any information about other transactions. I can't see the way that you spend funds. I can't see when you receive funds. You can do it very simply by just literally pasting that text string, and then anyone who wants to send can just copy and paste that text string. But you can do it in a way that preserves your privacy. Uh, that's not true on Bitcoin. So if you used a Bitcoin address, and you just posted that on your Twitter bio or whatever. Anyone could quickly see any donations that have been made. They could see the way that you spent them afterwards. Uh, they could usually tie those transactions back together. You sacrifice a massive amount of privacy in Bitcoin if you want that simplicity of just using a static address for donations. Um, so when I look at that, it's it's I think been a key reason why a large part of the the privacy focused free and open source space have started to accept donations in Monero. Um, and many have started to not only accept, but prefer donations in Monero. Uh, and this is something I have a blog post on it with a lot of uh, organizations and projects that do this, but it's it's been a growing trend because it is so much simpler. You don't need to run a fancy server to be able to accept funds in a privacy preserving way. Uh, you just paste the string, people can donate with privacy. You preserve the donor's privacy and your own privacy at the same time. Um, Another place where a mayor really shines, and, and a lot of it because of that simplicity with donations, is is really funding political activism and dissidents. Um, this is one where we may not think about this as much in the U.S. Um, privacy preserving donations for political purposes aren't as big of a deal because we've thankfully enjoyed pretty solid democracy over the years. Um, have had much more freedom than the majority of the world, uh, but. When you go outside of the US and even outside of Europe, uh, even some places within Europe that's changing, very quickly you see that the ability to fund political candidates that that you think will bring freedom to your country can quickly be something where even if it's technically legal at the time and technically allowed, that can quickly be used to persecute uh, and oppress you down the line. Um, so having ways that we can fund journalists, that we can fund political dissidents, that we can fund political candidates and parties while preserving both our privacy and theirs is a, a very important piece of continuing to drive democracy forward. And then lastly, merchant adoption. Um, we've seen, while it's not to the scale of Bitcoin, we've seen a, a massive amount of growth with merchants accepting Monero directly. I think a lot of that is, again, the simplicity. Static addresses work very well. You can just have a QR code and, and pay to the same one. Um, it's the the privacy that's inherent when you're running a business, you usually don't want your competitors and your customers to know uh, how much money you have, how you spend it, who you pay for supplies, all of those kinds of things. So the privacy that comes with Monero is a, a big boon there as well. Um, this slide may be a little bit kind of out of the scope for you guys. It depends on exactly where you're coming from. Um, but this has been a really helpful one when I chat with people who are already already understand Bitcoin, already maybe use Bitcoin, hold Bitcoin, spend Bitcoin. Um, and really what I try to do here, and we'll skim through this so we can go ahead and get to questions, but what I try to do here is kind of distill the ways that I see people either using Monero or, or not using Monero. Um, really going from kind of the more extreme, I love Monero side on the left to the the more uh, the more normal today, I use fiat for everything and I don't actually use cryptocurrency for anything. Um, where I see most people landing on this chart once they understand the value that at least I think that Bitcoin and Monero can bring, most people I think will land on the, the save in Bitcoin, spend Monero um, approach here. 
Uh, and really that's because there's a strong proven value proposition in Bitcoin. Um, at this time in a bear market, most people might not might not agree with me, and I'm a little less uh, less sure of my claims there as well. But um, it has had a very proven value prop over the years, where long term it's a, a good way to store wealth that's not able to be inflated away, um, and that's outside of the the reach of oppressive governments, etc. But when you actually want to spend cryptocurrency, once you've actually used Monero and sent a transaction and looked at it on a blockchain explorer to to see what's going on. It's really hard to go back because gaining strong financial privacy that's simple, approachable, and functions very similarly to how you'd use any kind of other uh, cryptocurrency, but while providing all of this privacy, uh, is a it's a very impressive thing, a very useful thing, and something that once you've used Monero, and if you actually want to spend cryptocurrency, uh, it's, a, I think, a clear win there. So that's where I see most people landing. Um, we won't dive into the rest, but we already talked about how Bitcoin can be very complex to use in a privacy-preserving way. Um, and once people start to use Monero, start to understand the, the value proposition as a tool for financial freedom, for censorship-resistant payments, uh, I think many will also choose to store some wealth in Monero. Uh, but that's that's probably a discussion for another day. I think for me especially, the, the focus is on having a tool that we can spend, having digital cash that we can use as a, a replacement for physical cash. So very quick conclusion. Um, ultimately, Monero was made to be a powerful tool for freedom. It's been built with these adversarial environments in mind that we've seen happening around the world, that we've seen ramping up around the world. Um, and I think it should be deeply considered as a part of every freedom-loving person's digital toolkit. Uh, and then last but not least, if you want to learn more about Monero, that QR code it won't give you an hour. Don't worry. Uh, it just goes to getmonero.org. Feel free to type it in yourself. Um, but that's where you can learn more about Monero, more about how it works, about how you can get connected, where you can download a wallet, download node software, all that fun stuff. Um, I have a blog, sethforprivacy.com, where I talk about Monero, about personal privacy, uh, link to my podcast on there, all that. I'm also on Signal. Um, feel free to, to shoot me a message at that number. I'm happy to chat with anybody. Um, I'm kind of notorious for being slow to respond to messages. Kevin can attest to that. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I will get back to you eventually. Uh, and then email hello at Seth Privacy if you want to chat via email um, for, for any reason as well. But that's it for me. Thank you all for, for sitting through that. Hopefully that was informative and helped you to see the differences between Bitcoin and Monero and the, the advantages that Monero brings as a tool for freedom. Um, but very thankful for the opportunity and uh, happy to, to answer any questions that y'all have. Um, well, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Seth. Um, yeah, I think what we'll do is um, anybody who has a question, you stated, and then I'll repeat it uh, both so Seth can hear it better and so anybody attending remotely can hear it better. Yeah. Can you lose policy by... The question is, do you lose privacy if you are using Monero through somebody else's node as opposed to your own node? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, so because of the strong on-chain privacy in Monero and this, this holistic approach, because all of this is actually generated on your device before you send the transaction out, you lose much less privacy when using someone else's node in Monero than you do when using someone else's node in Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera. Um, ultimately within Monero, the things that you reveal are your IP address, whether that's your real one or a VPN address, or if you're behind Tor, um, you reveal the transaction ID that you're sending, obviously. Um, and you reveal the time that you sent the transaction, of course, as well. That's pretty much it because you compute these one-time addresses yourself locally on the device because you compute these confidential amounts on device because you compute these ring signatures on device. All of the, the building of the transaction and, and hiding of these, these details happens locally. By the time you actually send the transaction, none of that's visible to the node. Um, the, the bigger risk with a node is that it'll feed you false information that will try to get you to pay like a, an absurdly high fee or something like that. It's It's more in a, a type of kind of separate attack rather than privacy invasive attacks. Um, it is still just like in Bitcoin, it's definitely advised to use your own node, mostly protect against those other types of attacks um, and to protect against them tying an IP address to a transaction ID if you're not hiding your IP address through like a, a VPN or Tor. Um, but it, it does reveal a lot less information around that. Um, I actually wrote an article on this uh, at localmonero.co um, and I can... I can drop the link in the, the Zoom chat uh, in a minute, but 
um, that walks through those details as well. But ultimately, you you reveal some information, but very little and much less than when using Bitcoin or, or similar cryptocurrency. Great. Uh, more questions. A lot of people here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, uh, yeah. You. Uh, what do you think was uh, most likely scenario to kind of play out if U.S. government were to uh, ban the narrow and from exchanges? How would the narrow ecosystem continue to kind of uh, operate from there? The question is, what if the U.S. government bans the use of Monero? Can you you talked already a bit about how it's a lot more censorship resistant of that scenario than Bitcoin, but could you maybe go into a little more detail about how the Monero ecosystem would keep functioning in the event of sanctions like that? Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a great question, and it's one that's been at the heart of how we in the Monero community approach building both the the cryptocurrency itself, the protocol and in building out the ecosystem. Um, so the biggest problem in that type of a, a ban scenario is, in my mind, not really the the function of the network, not really sending transactions. Um, but like I think you hinted at in your question, a lot of it would be in just being able to actually get Monero or being able to sell Monero for dollars or whatever your local currency is. Um, and that's that's really the pain point. That's that's why governments have been slowly tightening the noose on exchanges around the world. They've been restricting uh, Bitcoin ATMs. They've been restricting exchanges from doing anything without requiring the the ID of every user, so that they can have the information on when you transact, how much you withdraw, how much you buy, etc. Um, so they understand that that's the the point that they can squeeze people the most within cryptocurrencies. So. Within the Monero community, we've been focused on building out peer-to-peer -peer ways to be able to actually exchange Monero for Bitcoin, because Bitcoin has lots of good on-ramps, um, and Monero for, for dollars or fiat, et cetera. Um, there's some really good solutions for that right now. The, the main ones, if you have Bitcoin already, would be uh, Agora Desk, which is a peer-to-peer -peer direct uh, exchange. It's not decentralized. It's a centralized website and service, but the people we are actually trading with are, are other peers directly. Um, there's also BISQ, B-I-S-Q, uh, which is a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized um, anonymous tool for swapping between cryptocurrencies or for buying Bitcoin for, for fiat, for dollars. Um, and it works very well today. But also we've been building out um, two other solutions. One is something called Atomic Swaps, which essentially is you being able to programmatically swap Bitcoin for Monero and vice versa in a way that uh, even if you don't trust the person on the other end, as you normally wouldn't in a, an anonymous peer-to-peer -peer swap, um, it ensures that either both of you get the right amount of funds or the transaction does not go through and nobody loses funds. Um, that's going to be really key, especially for very aggressive adversarial environments. Uh, it has some downsides in that liquidity and that type of thing can be more difficult. Um, but it's it's a very important tool. And uh, the Monero community has spent lots and lots of money funding work around that uh, in a decentralized grassroots way. Um, the other approach is something called Serai, which is a, a decentralized exchange that's being built out actually by a good friend of mine, um, S-E-R-A-I. Um, and it'll, it's hard to explain. If you know what Uniswap is in the Ethereum world, it's similar to that, but more decentralized and focused on Monero at its core. Um, but that will be another way that'll be much more akin to using a normal exchange, but will be decentralized and be censorship resistant, um, kind of in between a, a centralized exchange and a peer-to-peer -peer atomic swap, um, but having really kind of some of the advantages of both. Um, so ultimately, I think those will those would be the biggest problems with a Monero ban, but actually sending, receiving Monero, mining Monero wouldn't really be that problematic uh, in those scenarios because privacy is at the core of everything that we do. There's very easy ways to use Tor with your node. There's very easy ways to mine behind Tor. We have decentralized mining pools now. There's there's really not a whole lot that a government could do against the actual protocol itself, but they'd go after those on and off ramps for sure. Uh, yes. Is there anything about the tokenomics that would make the narrow like speculation or volatility resistant, or was there any reason to be to design it that way? Basic question is, does Monero have properties that make it more friendly as an actual currency and less a speculative investment the way Bitcoin has largely turned into? Yeah, um, there's not a 
the, the key problem, and this is something that we've seen with most approaches to stable coins within the cryptocurrency space, is if you try to build a stable coin to be algorithmic and decentralized, in a sense, trying to build a stable coin that somehow keeps its peg to the dollar or something else uh, in a decentralized fashion, it almost always fails catastrophically. If you've heard of Luna, that's a good example of someone trying to do a decentralized stable coin and it leading to lots of people losing lots of money because they they messed up one specific aspect of how it works. Um, and so with Monero, we haven't tried to do that. We haven't tried to touch that. And ultimately, anything is going to be speculated on. I mean, this happens with basically everything in the real world, everything you think of, there's lots of things you don't think could be made speculative that are speculative. Um, but when you look at Monero and Bitcoin specifically, there's nothing specifically that should make them go up in value or should make people speculate on them. It's it's just greed. And that will always exist. The main thing with something like Monero is that it's not just a speculative asset. And the Monero community has been very focused on trying to do as much as we can to not make speculation the focus um, in our discussions, in our communities, et cetera. Obviously, there's still people who speculated on it, but the, the key difference for me is that Monero is used and it's used heavily, um, that it, it it sees real world usage that is not speculative, but is actual peer-to-peer -peer transaction, that's actual merchant adoption, that's actual growth in usage. And that growth in usage will build stability over time. One of the reasons why I think we haven't seen stability in Bitcoin is because speculative narratives have been the the leading narrative in the communities, and usage has been something that has been suppressed and said to be bad and pushed back on. And this whole kind of hodl mentality leads to speculative bust and boom cycles. Whereas within Monero, we're focused on using, actually spending, actually using it as a currency. And the more actual usage of a currency like this that there is, the more of a, a floor of buy pressure, the more the more um, stability there will be. And we've seen much more stability in Monero than Bitcoin over the last few years. But there's still speculation. There's still people trading it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, and there's not something programmatic that we've put in to prevent that. In my opinion, there's not a way to prevent that. Um, but that's one of the things where as usage grows, I think that the, the kind of uh, the boom and bust cycles will get less and less and less. Yeah. As far as the programming language for a Monero transaction, uh, what is the name of the language and what is the advantage that Monero has over Bitcoin and uh, script? Uh, the question is, what programming language is the Monero blockchain written in and what advantages does it have over oh, 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 sorry. the transactions themselves? Sorry, what language is the transactions themselves written in and what advantages does it have over Bitcoin script? So in Monero, there actually is no scripting. Uh, so there's actually very different from, from Bitcoin and actually much simpler. Um, so in Monero, there's no script. There's no... Uh, fancy functionality like that. There's no operator or nothing like that. Um, so it's it's very simplified. The the privacy and all of the the details around how funds can be spent are well, there actually aren't really controls over that. There's a lot less control over how funds can be spent in Monero, and part of that is because we actually hard fork to enforce protocol changes, protocol improvements. So that everyone spending transactions within Monero use the same exact approach. And that's that's for privacy. That's because if we allowed things like in Bitcoin, where they allow multiple script types, they allow custom scripts, they allow all of this stuff to be done transparently and differently, it means that transactions in Bitcoin stand out from each other. They're, they're not fungible. They're not interchangeable. And so there's a, a huge loss of privacy because of that. Within Monero, both because the original protocol didn't have a scripting language and because we're aiming for privacy more than we are extend extensibility, um, there's no scripting natively. Uh, there's basically, there's a, a raw text field you can put data in if you want, um, but it's not used for something specifically. There's also a payment code field that we're working on deprecating that you can use like as a merchant to distinguish payments between specific uh, like customers. Um, but other than that, it's really just inputs, outputs. Um, there's basic multi-sig as well, uh, but there's actually no no scripting language at all within Monero. Uh, the code itself is written in C++, but I know that that wasn't your the core of your question. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question related as a merchant. 
and what's the best way or best practice for getting involved in offering my goods in exchange, you know, in, in the in the AR community. Question is, I run a business. I want to be able to accept customers Monero. What's the easiest, best way for me to get set up to support that? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, it's something we've been focusing more and more on in the in the Monero community. Um, if you want to accept Bitcoin as well, I think that the, the best tool right now for both is something that's called BTC Pay Server. Um, it's something that, that you can host yourself, run yourself. I have a guide that walks you through this. If you have basic familiarity with installing anything in Linux or using Linux command line. It'll guide you through everything. If you're not comfortable with that, it's probably a little bit outside of the kind of the simple realm right now, unfortunately, it's something that we're working on. Um, but if you spin up that server, you can essentially use it as your, um, your e-commerce gateway. It plugs into WooCommerce, Shopify, all of the normal um, kind of merchant solutions directly. If you have like an in-person store, the easiest way is just have a Monero wallet, show them a QR code when they go to pay, see the amount that they spent matches what you need and just move on. Um, and you you essentially can treat it like cash uh, in your accounting. But that is obviously very simple. That that, that also doesn't work for, for the digital aspect. Um, if you do also want to accept it simply digitally, I mean, you, you can also just have a, a static address that you put as a custom checkout option. They send funds there and you can process it manually. But again, that's... Not ideal. So thankfully, there is a tool called BTC Pay Server that, that handles both Bitcoin and Monero um, quite cleanly. You can use it just for Monero as well, but it's especially useful if you want to if you want to use Bitcoin uh, together with it. There's a couple other cool ones that are being worked on. One is called Hot Shop, H O T S H O P, uh, that uh, a friend of mine in the Monero community is building out. Um, that's intended to be a very easy point of sale system, uh, but it doesn't even require you to run your node. You can point it at a public node and and uh, accept transactions, get confirmation, and everything like that directly in that that app. Um, so there's there are some good solutions, but it's not it's not plug and play yet. We, we need to do better with that. Uh, that's something where we've I think been lacking in the past, um, and I'm sure that's held back merchant adoption. Yeah, uh, you in the bank? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was going to see if the future of Monero. Um, because there's, you know, talk about like these people accepting Monero as merchants, or like what happens with CBDC Monero is going to go up and down. That is probably such a Basic question is, what's the future of Monero? Does it basically go mainstream and becomes as easy as cash for the digital world? Or does it get sanctioned and become a tool of underground uh, dissidents and rebels? What's the future look like? Oh, it's a good one. Um, so I'm. it depends on who you ask, of course. There are people who think it will be a, a mainstream tool. I'm definitely more in the camp of this, just like most other privacy tools, will be things that remain relatively niche um, and that remain used by those people who understand the importance of privacy and to, who see the need to opt out of a, a broken system. Um, so it's not something where like I think your grandma is going to be going to Walmart and paying for her groceries in Monero. Um, I, I don't think that that's the future that we have in store for us. Um, if we did have that future in store, that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, and that would be a, a very optimistic one. So I would love to see that. But just like most tools like this, I think my my vision is ultimately, and, and how I gauge success, is if people can gain freedom using this tool to make peer-to-peer -to -peer transactions, uh, to build circular and parallel economies, if they can do that with or without the approval of their government, uh, in spite of oppression and um, uh, harsh geopolitical uh, setups, it's it's a success in my book. Um, but obviously, I want to see it used by as many people as possible, and that's why I've been pushing hard in, in education and in content creation, et cetera, for Monero um, over the past few years in, in multiple platforms. But it is something where ultimately people need to understand why this stuff matters before they start to use tools for it. And just like most people don't know what the EFF is. Unfortunately, most people I talk to don't. Um, I think most people won't wake up to this need or at least won't wake up to it immediately. Um, but I think we also have seen a very encouraging past couple of years. We've seen a lot of people start to understand that institutions and governments a lot of times don't have their best interest at heart. Uh, I think that's been a hard wake up call for a lot of people, but um, with it comes the knowledge that they can do something different, that they can break out of that, that they they can gain digital sovereignty. Uh, and Monero is a, a key tool for that. So optimistically, a lot of people use it. Uh, 
I think the most realistic is the the people that wake up to the need for it, use it in the future, and it, it continues to drive circular and parallel econ- economies that are resistant to and and thrive in spite of or alongside the the communities around them. Yeah. Are there any uh, tokens that are merge mined with the Monero blockchain, like like Voyager's or Bitcoin? Are there any uh, tokens that are merge mined with Monero? Uh, so there aren't right now. Uh, there's one that's been in development for whew, a long time called Tari, T A R I. I don't know if it's actually a thing anymore. I haven't followed up on it a few years, in a, I don't know, probably two years now. Their goal was merge mining with Monero. Um, I know there's a, there's actually a game that its whole functionality is is on a blockchain and is merge mined with Monero. It's called Town Forge. It was created by one of the uh, most prolific Monero devs, just kind of as, as a side project. Um, but that's just the you can mine the in-game currency by merge mining Monero. Um, there's also I've had some discussions with some upcoming privacy-focused layer one blockchains where merge mining. I think is the best solution for them and they were very interested. So I think it's something that we'll see grow over time uh, as Monero uh, eventually will be one of the few proof of work algorithms outside of Bitcoin that actually persists thanks to the the ASIC resistance. Um, so I think we'll see it, but right now there's really just actually the game Town Forge as far as I know for merge mining. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, Monero transactions and um, I believe the question is basically that due to the uh, plain text field in Monero, is it possible for a privacy roll up to essentially make use of it? Is that, am I phrasing your question correctly? Uh, um, yeah, so did like I, the form did I, of layer two to be built on top of Monero. Yeah, you you asked something a little more technical, so I'm, I'm glad that he understands your question. Yeah, go on. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. So actually, I have a presentation that I did on this at MoneroCon, which is like our our community grassroots uh, meet uh, conference that we just kickstarted again this last year, um, and I talked about how we could build layer two networks on Monero. Um, it's not as easy as using that plain text field. Uh, the the best approaches so far essentially would be building a, a lightning network like layer two. Uh, if you're familiar with Bitcoin's lightning network, you can essentially build the same thing on Monero, but because we don't have a scripting language, it complicates how you actually handle the creation of channels, um, which this is all getting really technical for people who aren't familiar with layer twos, but essentially there are ways within Monero to be able to do that uh, without harming the privacy of both yourself and other people on chain. It's a little bit more complex, but you can build essentially a, a lightning network on top of Monero, um, even if we remove that open text field, which we probably will because it's a it's a privacy flaw right now. If someone is using it or some wallet is using it for some reason, uh, it can lead to some some tracing there. So it probably will be removed. But without that, we can still do these types of transactions um, using multi-sig and, and other approaches there. So I have a presentation on it. If you look up MoneroCon, uh, Monero, K-O-N, Seth for privacy, you should be able to find the, the actual presentation where I, I walk through all that. I get what you're asking now. Great question. Um, yeah. Um, any other questions? Uh, yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I had a question regarding, like, the basics of getting the narrow, would it, if it becomes a sanctional thing, would being able to acquire the narrow also like participate with that as a factory physically or a centralized exchange or something that would flag it as you would want to purchase that Monero and then you become a target? I think the question is basically like, are Monero's privacy protections strong enough that if Monero was to be sanctioned by the government, if you bought Monero through a centralized exchange, is Monero so privacy preserving that they would still have some trouble identifying you or no? Well, so this is, this is a really good question. And this is, uh, I think, one of constant debate within the Monero community. Um Within the cryptocurrency space, there's this idea of, it's just usually called like KYC or no KYC. That comes from a, a financial regulation called Know Your Customer or Anti-Money Laundering Laws. Um, essentially, those regulations are responsible for when you use a centralized exchange like Coinbase, they make you give them your ID, take a selfie, 
take a video of you dancing around with your passport over your head, all this, this fun stuff to prove who you are before you can buy and sell Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. That's because of this, this KYC regulation. Um, if you buy Monero on one of the centralized exchanges that do KYC, that have your, your ID on hand, there's no hiding the fact that you bought Monero. I mean, you, you're giving them your ID and you're saying, I want to buy this much Monero and I'm withdrawing this much Monero. The difference with Monero versus Bitcoin is what you do with that Monero afterwards is very likely going to be completely hidden from them. Um, they're not going to have any visibility into the way that you actually spend it, where you send it, if you send it all to someone else, if you keep it all, whatever. They can't see those details. But if a ban or sanctions happen on Monero and they say, everyone who's bought Monero on a centralized exchange, tell us what you did with it and send us all of the records of how you've used your Monero or we'll throw you in jail. The records are there that you bought Monero and that you threw it to your own wallet. So there's there's no hiding that. And, and that's why even within Monero, even with the transactional privacy that it provides, if you're in a jurisdiction where you're worried about that happening more, more quickly, if or if you're in the US and you're just worried that that might be a possibility long term, or if you just want to make sure that if one of these exchanges inevitably gets hacked, some person on the internet doesn't have access to your your ID, your driver's license, your passport, your home address, and the fact that you bought $100,000 in Monero back in 2020, um, avoiding these types of exchanges is very important. And that's where the, the tools that I talked about earlier, like Agora Desk, like BISC, um, like local Monero are really important tools to be able to, to buy Monero in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer way without providing your ID um, so that there's not that record that the government can easily just ask for that says, this person owns Monero, they live here, we can go knock on their door and, and force them to give over information or give up the Monero, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, some companies like analysis are really good at playing the game of the words to sort of try to obfuscate elements of the old blockchain. Do you have any insight into whether there's plans that any crypto would be all or is more important than other? The question is, certain companies claim that they are able to partially de-anonymize uh, Monero. Is there any truth to their claims, or are they basically similar to Facebook's ad targeting, claiming they have magic powers not backed up by fact? <laughs> uh, very similar to Facebook's ad targeting. Yeah, so the the only chain surveillance company, and I, I very intentionally use those words. Chain analysis is kind of the common term, but that kind of gives them too much credit for somehow being good or okay. Chain surveillance, I think, is a more accurate term, so I try to use that one. Um, the only one that claims to be able to trace Monero is one called Cypher Trace. Uh, the Monero community actually has done a lot of investigation trying to figure out what they can actually trace. We've talked to their CEO. We've talked to multiple people on the team. Obviously, they have an incentive to hide the amount of information that they can, then can trace on Monero, the amount of information they can get. From their knowledge, from the things that they're able to describe, I think that there's very little evidence that they have any capabilities beyond a, a visual block explorer that lets you see where inputs and outputs go. But it doesn't give you uh, visibility into which is the true spend, where the funds are going, wallet clustering, all of this other stuff. Um, that's as much as we know. A another kind of key uh, point of information that's helpful is they're charging 16 grand for the service of tracing Monero which if you are familiar with the chain surveillance scene, and I know many people who are, that is like nothing, like absolutely nothing in that uh, space. And so if you're charging that little and you're the only one in the space who can trace the most famous and most popular privacy preserving cryptocurrency, I think it's also a sign that it's not an effective tool. Um, we've also never seen a single case of Monero being traced in actual court documents, which is a, an actual, uh, actually a really helpful way to see how effective a tool is. I've done a lot of work digging through um, court documents for Bitcoin tracing. There's not a single case where Monero was actually traced in a court case uh, and, and used as evidence, at least. Obviously, that could have been done behind closed doors and not released to the public. It's possible, but we have no evidence of Monero actually being traced today. Um, I've also personally spoken to multiple chain surveillance companies. Uh, all of them essentially say Monero is not worth tracing. We can't do it right now. We don't know how we would do it. And if we did do it, Monero would just improve the protocol, change something in the protocol to make it impossible. Um, so there's really, a, thankfully, a defeatism in the chain surveillance space where they don't see the point. They think it's too hard right now. And if they did do something, 
we just fix it anyways. Um, so I don't think there's any reason to believe those claims, but obviously we should continue to be careful. We should continue to keep our ears open. Just like if he's, some news came out about signal being traceable or something like that, we should investigate it. We should test the veracity of those claims. Um, but thankfully in Monero's case, as far as we can tell, there's there's no veracity in the claims that Cypher Trace, who are the only ones that claim to be able to do this, can actually actually trace Monero. Um, I'm for any question that actually comes from online here. The question is basically under updated uh, IRS uh, tax guidelines, you are supposed to declare all your cryptocurrency assets or you are technically um, you know, not reporting your taxes correctly. How does this affect Monero where the whole point is you maybe don't want Uncle Sam to know how much Monero you have and what you're doing with it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'll preface by saying I'm not a lawyer. This isn't tax advice. <laughs> I'm not advising you to do anything or not do anything with your taxes. Not um, our tech lawyers are her either, FYI. Yeah, this is, this is certainly not that kind of scenario. So I'm not advising anyone to evade taxes or anything like that. Um, with Monero, an important thing to understand is that while it is private by default, if you need to opt out of that privacy and reveal transactional information to someone like an accountant, to someone like the IRS, God forbid, um, you can do that. You can choose to reveal that information as you choose. It's very much in the, the spirit of privacy of selectively revealing yourself. You can reveal that information as you need to. Um, you can account for it just like Bitcoin. You can account for transactions made for gains and losses, et cetera. Um, there's nothing that changes with Monero around that. It's just that no one else can do that for you, <laughs> essentially, without you providing that information, which is, is important. And, and ultimately, that's the way that financial privacy should work. Um, as far as how taxes work and all that, I mean, yeah, it's probably not something to get into too much, but ultimately you should probably abide by local laws. Um, you can do all of the same things with Monero that you do with Bitcoin and, and how you actually count for it. Um, but just like some people handle cash differently, I'm sure some people handle Monero differently. Um, that's all I'll say, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... In Texas, a ton of energy gets used mining blockchains, and Monero is a proof of work based system. Is there such a thing as other consensus algorithms that don't use as much energy but still preserve privacy? Is proof of stake even privacy preserving at all? What is the status of next generation sort of consensus algorithm? Um, basic question is, you know, um, so Monero is currently um, a proof of work and, and, you know, there's there's some legitimate concerns about energy usage in the environment with uh, proof of um, work algorithms. The question is, is there basically, um, are there plans for essentially Monero potentially exploring other staking mechanisms like proof of stake? There are other ones. Um, just has the Monero space thought about those uh, those criticisms that sometimes come from the environmental sector? Oh, and are there like privacy focused? Are the, are there privacy focused coins? Maybe not Monero that um, use other uh, proof mechanisms. So yeah, I mean it's a it's an interesting area. Um, the whole proof of work energy usage debate is a, a broad one, um, and one that the more I dig in on the Bitcoin side, the more I see the the value proposition and the unique benefits that Bitcoin mining brings to the energy grid, to stability, uh, to utilizing renewable energy, to reducing flaring. Uh, there are a lot of benefits that come with the ability for you to essentially create money out of energy um, anywhere in the world, as long as you have internet access. Uh, there's really cool stuff that's being done because of Bitcoin mining. Um, so that's the only quick note I'll say, we won't dive too much into the energy usage. Monero mining, due to its nature, due to it being more grassroots, more decentralized, mined on commodity hardware, um, would have a much lower environmental impact than um, than Bitcoin. No one's buying computers specifically to buy Monero. I mean, I'm sure some people are, but you can mine it on anything. So ultimately, you're not creating more waste. You're able to use your, your desktop when you're not actively using it. You just flip on a program, you can mine Monero. It's just that that low wattage usage of a desktop. So I think there are much lower concerns around energy usage with Monero. Um, the main issue with proof of stake historically has been both how secure actually is it? Uh, and I think we're starting to see that approaches can be taken where it can be relatively secure. Um, but it's also been historically very hard to do while preserving user privacy. 
because you need a way to be able to attest to how much people are staking to try to limit civil attacks. You need a lot of different approaches to be built into that system that usually require transparency. And if a large majority of your network are staking, as normally they would at a proof of stake system, and revealing all the information about all of their outputs in order to do so, you harm the system as a whole. Um, there are some interesting approaches to that that are being developed. Uh, a project that I'm I'm close with and, and is kind of near near and dear to my heart called DarkFi uh, is actually looking at a privacy preserving way to do proof of stake. Uh, the specific protocol is called Ouroboros, um, but there there are ways to do it. It's difficult, it's untested, it's theoretical. I don't think it's something that we in the Monero community are actively looking at because proof of work is incredibly effective. Our algorithm is incredibly effective and it it lowers the barrier to entry. The other main thing with proof of stake is that if you want to get into the system, you have to buy it somehow. You can't start staking if you have no Monero and we use proof of stake. Whereas with mining, anyone can get Monero today by just turning on a miner and waiting. Um, so that that barrier to entry with proof of stake is a key one as well. We want to ensure that even in this the harshest of adversarial environments, if you have no one you can swap dollars for Monero for, you can mine on your computer over Tor and you can slowly accumulate Monero that way. Uh, and that's something you would lose if you move to proof of stake. So it's not an active one within the Monero community. It is absolutely an active point of investigation for lots of researchers throughout the cryptocurrency space. Um, and there are some interesting projects that are, are looking to implement privacy preserving proof of stake moving forward. So that'll be interesting to watch. And if it is very successful, if it is proven over the years, um, I I wouldn't say that it's beyond Monero implementing it, um, but it's it's certainly not a focus right now. Uh, yeah. I was wondering if you um, might be hoping to expand more on using Monero in circular and parallel ways. If you're talking about versus uh, non-circular or off-ramp or, you know, is it better to use Monero in a small group that amongst themselves or like something where someone's buying, like, you know, taking Monero, but transferring to a gift card and then paying at Applebee's for the gift card or something? I, I think to summarize the question, the question is, do you think it, Monero has more utility um, as essentially um an off-ramp, an on-ramp from the official economy where you can preserve privacy of a transaction, but you're basically going from the public economy into the space, they have the private transaction, then you come back. Or is it more appropriate to really view it in terms of these circular or parallel economies where small communities and groups of people have basically created a self-contained economic ecosystem where they transact with each other? That's a, that's a very, very good question. Um, when I approach it, I would say, hopefully it enables both. Uh, that would be the goal, that it is really something that enables you to both mostly exist within kind of the standard economy and just use it as necessary or use it with specific merchants that you like that accept it. Um, and that's probably mostly the case right now. Um, but as someone who's kind of a, a burgeoning crypto anarchist, I think that the the place where tools like this will be the most useful is in these circular and parallel economies. Parallel economies are, are normally more what you may refer to as like darknet markets or black markets. Uh, I know they have a bad name right now because most people associate them with drugs and illicit activity, but there's a, a long history of them being tools for survive, survival and democracy and freedom, especially in, in Europe and in other countries throughout the world. Um, circular economies, on the other hand, are more this idea of you buy Monero and then you you spend it and you circulate it throughout a, an economy where the money stays in Monero. You're not constantly on and off ramping. Those off ramps and those on ramps exist, but most of the the money, most of the Monero is, is circulating through this growing and uh, vibrant economy where merchants accept it, merchants use it to pay suppliers, where people accept it for side jobs that they do and people use it to, to buy goods and services. Um, I think that's most of the place where we see it right now are these circular and parallel economies. Um, but I would hope that it would enable both of those moving forward. Um, I, I do also have a presentation on specifically how Monero enables circular and parallel economies that I gave last year as well. Um, if you look up Monerotopia, Seth for privacy, uh, I can send some of these links to Kevin too, and, and maybe he can distribute these as well. Um, but I, I gave a presentation on specifically those topics and kind of how it is used as a tool to to enable those and to to allow those to be built, uh, like I said before, either alongside of or in spite of the uh, the geopolitical circumstances and the the communities around them, um, and that's 
that's really the value that I see in these tools is that it, it enables people to build free economies, to build free communities um, with or without approval of, of uh, governments, et cetera. Um, yeah, back there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Bitcoin has been taxed by the point of money. So uh, does the Monero have any sort of max supply? If not, uh, what mechanisms are in place to prevent like, inflation from just on the big supply? Um, basic question is Does um, Monero like Bitcoin have a token cap? And if it doesn't, how does it prevent runaway inflation? Yeah, so that's a really good question. That's a, a more common one within kind of the, the Bitcoin circles. So Monero takes a similar but different approach to Bitcoin. Um, within Bitcoin, I, I'm sure you're aware because you're asking this question. Maybe other people in the in the room aren't. Bitcoin has what I would call an arbitrary hard cap, which essentially is that there there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin uh, units. Um, that was chosen early on. It really was a, a random number that was due to the um, the size of the the integer that he allowed in the in the programming language. Um, that hard cap is often used for pushing Bitcoin as a speculative asset, um, but it has some serious downsides in that once that hard cap is reached, there's and actually far before that hard cap is reached and and much much sooner. Um, there will be very little Bitcoin actually being provided to miners to incentivize them to secure the network. And so the only incentive to secure Bitcoin will be transaction fees. So one of two things will happen. Either transacting in Bitcoin will be horrifyingly expensive because you as the person spending Bitcoin has to pay to fund the security of the network out of pocket or Bitcoin will die uh, or Bitcoin will fork and implement some something else to be able to sustain itself. Um, that is in the future. We don't know when that will happen exactly, when that kind of threshold will be met. But right now, it's something like 99.6% of income for miners is from the block subsidy, which is the, the Bitcoin that's newly created in each block. Uh, and the 0.04% or 0.4% is actually from transaction fees. So there's not a good outlook right now on transaction fees being enough to secure Bitcoin's network. But that does remain to be seen. Um, Monero takes a different approach. And the Monero does not have a hard cap. Essentially, what Monero has is it has what's called the defined supply. Um, that defined supply is 18.4 million Monero. Once that's hit, and this was actually hit in May, I think, of 2022. So we're past this point. Once that's hit, we hit what's called the tail emission. Um, and this has been programmed in from the beginning. It's not something that was changed or decided on last year or anything like this. This is always the the design behind Monero. But essentially, what's that, what that means is that once that point was hit, Every block of Monero mined moving forward provides 0.6 XMR as a reward for miners. And so that ensures that even if there aren't transactions, even if there aren't high transaction fees, miners can expect a specific award, reward for mining each block, and thus for securing the network. Um, so that helps us to provide longevity to security within Monero, but it does have a defined supply. So there's not just random inflation. No one can create funds within Monero out of thin air. Only that set amount can be and it's actually uh, it's technically disinflationary. Uh, the inflation percentage approaches 0% forever, um, but it's a very low inflation rate. It's already below the inflation rate of Bitcoin, gold, et cetera, and will only decrease from here. So it's a different approach. It's geared towards long-term security, but we lose some of the, at least the, the mimetic value of uh, 21 million hard cap, all the fun stuff that, that Bitcoiners love to, to throw around. Um, yeah, I think. yeah. So, uh, you mentioned earlier that the, I guess the Monero development community is not afraid to do hard works to make changes to the protocol. So, what is the most exciting upcoming hard work change uh, in the Monero community? Um, what are the upcoming uh, features being added to the Monero protocol that we you are looking forward to? Uh, uh, the hard forks specifically. Yeah, yeah, that's a it's a good question. Um, there's actually two really exciting upgrades on the roadmap. Um, the two main ones that we're looking at right now they're called Seraphis and Jamtis, and those are just the the names that are assigned to them. Essentially, what Seraphis is is it's a 
a new approach to their transaction protocol. It uses similar building blocks. There's still one-time addresses. There's still confidential amounts. There's still ring signatures, but it essentially overhauls the entire protocol and the, the actual code base and the way that it's done uh, and changes the cryptography a bit to be much more efficient. Um, so essentially what that will mean is not only will it be easier to improve and iterate and expand on the transaction protocol in the future as we discover new things, as new cryptographic breakthroughs happen, but it also will mean that because of the efficiency improvements with Seraphis ring signatures, which which right now each ring consists of 16 inputs, 15 of which are, are decoys, are fake. Um, but again, like I said before, no external person can tell which one's the real, which 15 are the fake ones. Uh, with Seraphis, we'll probably have either somewhere between 64 and 128 ring size. Um, so essentially it'll make it even harder to deduce which the real input is. And specifically, it will prevent the only couple ways that Monero can be theoretically traced, which is through very targeted, very specific, uh, very aggressive attacks against a single entity. Um, but those will essentially become almost impossible to do after Seraphis because of the increase in ring size. Um, the other big one is called Jamtus, and that's an acronym. I'm not going to get into what it stands for. Uh, it sounds like a terrible name when you just say it, though. We need a need a better naming scheme there. But um, essentially, Jamtus will bring a lot of changes to the way that, that addresses work within Monero. I won't get into details here, but it'll, it'll really simplify the experience for users. Right now, we have standard addresses. We have sub-addresses. We have uh, payment codes. There's a lot of different annoying nuance with what type of address you want us into within Monero, even though they all do the same thing on chain. Um, and so this will simplify that. It'll introduce some ways that merchants can essentially do verification on addresses to prevent man in the middle attacks with address, uh, like replacement in a clipboard or something like that. Um, and it'll bring some improvements to, uh, how wallets can actually handle keys. Um, it'll make things like uh, a light wallet that uses a, another server to actually look for outputs and tell you which outputs are yours. It'll be able to do that with much more privacy. It'll enable a lot a lot more use cases with wallets that'll help user experience. Um, so the, the combination of improving privacy with Seraphis and efficiency and extensibility, and then improving user experience with Jamtus, uh, I think will be really important as we continue to see adoption ramp up. Yeah. If you did want to make money with Monero mining, any recommendations? <laughs> Um, I missed the beginning of that, but just about general mining recommendations for like hardware. I mean, I mean, basically, if you wanted to make mine Monero and make money mm -hmm. that way, are there best practices or ways you should go about it? If specifically making money is one of your goals, yeah. So if that's the goal, essentially, you want to either have your desktop computer be specifically targeted towards mining Monero, or you want to build, um computers that are targeted towards mining Monero. Essentially what that means is right now, the most efficient way to mine Monero uh, is on AMD CPUs, just their architecture, the the way that they approach cash. There's a few other things in their approach that make them a bit more efficient than Intel CPUs for mining Monero. Um, so if you want to be as profitable as possible, usually what you want to do is buy the lowest end of the most recent generation of AMD CPU, put it in a very cheap motherboard, use relatively fast RAM, um, and then mine away. There are ways to, there are efficiency changes. There's some stuff that goes into that, but it's it's pretty straightforward. Um, generally, what I would say, though, is just when you want to upgrade your, like your desktop computer or something, if mining Monero is important to you, um, just target what's kind of an efficient CPU at the time, and that will still fit your needs. Uh, that's something that is that then you can use in, in idle time to to mine Monero. Um, but mining at scale profitably has been something that's hard within Monero. Uh, most of the time, miners have been underwater just due to the market, due to the fact that it's grassroots and so many people are are willing to mine at a loss that it's it hasn't been a, a hugely profitable venture. Um, but that may change in the future, and it's something I've been mining Monero since the day I got into Monero for so for the past almost five years. Um, so it's something that I've kind of gone through the ups and downs and it's been a fascinating venture, but it's it's not something that I've done for profit. So I'm probably not the best person to speak to like in like how to build out a, a mining rig, mining farm, something like that. Um, yeah. I just wanted to add on to that because I, I didn't really start mining the for like profit, but that was obviously my question. Like what can we do is what's the best way? Um, you mentioned your pure pool. That's 
statistically the best way. Um, I forget the exact numbers, but when I was talking to some people about it, they pointed out like people who just like dedicated money by themselves get paid on average is like I don't want to say it was like seven years or something ridiculous like that. That's probably wrong, but it was ridiculous. Whereas when I did here here pool, I was getting paid. It was like a few cents, but it was every couple of years. And then when I started doing my wife's computer, when she was in my town, she was getting better. She got a CPU around it. It was like everything I was making better. Mm -hmm. So, here's a little bit of that. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see, we're starting to get low on time, so probably just time for a couple more questions. Uh, yeah. So what, how does the uh, narrow community sort of combat the narrative around criminals, only criminals use Monero, and like how do you balance privacy protection versus the need for, um, for criminals to use it for that reason? Uh, uh, somebody just asked one of the questions I was going to ask if we didn't get to it, which is, um, how does the Monero community counter the narrative that the only reason you would care about this level of financial privacy is that you want to do shady illegal things, never mind all the shady illegal things done with dollars every day. And I guess I'll add as a follow up on that, how do you counter the narrative that people they get caught up in their own personal brand of politics where they're like, oh, but I want the government to be able to stop the transactions of my political enemies. Like, how do you get through to people that there is a bigger issue here beyond any personal political squabble? Yeah, those are some some very good ones. And I mean, honestly, that that type of question is one that I've had to push back on for for years in the privacy space too. I mean, you get the same thing about just wanting to have personal privacy, about wanting to use Signal or wanting to get off Facebook. It's a lot of the same questions of like everyone else does this. Why are you weird? Like, why are you being weird? Why are you choosing to to actually care about this stuff? Um, so when we talk about Monero, I mean, I, Kevin hit the nail on the head. Uh, an easy way to explain to people why financial privacy should matter and why they shouldn't view Monero as a tool that's only used for criminals is the U.S. dollar is by far the most used financial tool for criminals. So if we truly think someone's weird for using a tool that criminals use, the dollar would be a much better substitute. And that still is and probably will continue for a very long time to be the most used tool by criminals. Um, outside of that, I mean, I think... Uh, a key aspect is a lot of the same stuff that like Glenn Greenwald, Snowden, that a lot of people in this space use to to describe to people why they actually care about privacy. And I mean, even just if you're looking at financial privacy and, and someone's thinking that it's, it's strange that you want to use Monero and you want financial privacy, if you ask them for their last six bank statements, do you think that they're going to hand those over? If you ask them for their credit card statements, if you ask them to pull out Apple Pay and show you where they're sending money, if you ask them to pull out Cash App and, and tell you the last 20 people that they sent money to and what those things were for, do you think that's something they'd actually want to give to you? No. No one wants to give up that kind of information. Most people don't realize that the companies that they're they're giving that information to are using that to prey on them, to profit off of them, et cetera. But most people have an innate sense of privacy, have an innate desire for privacy, but most people aren't willing to give up convenience for it. So that's a, kind of another way that I um, that I push back on that one. Um, what was your follow-up question, Kevin? Sorry. I mean, that, you know, people can get very caught up in oh, like, yes. oh, I want to be able to stop the transactions of mm -hmm. my... Uh, political enemies, like, you know, maybe, maybe a liberal doesn't want those uh, truckers to get the money, or maybe a conservative doesn't want people trying to uh, fund abortion access in Texas to get that money. How do you get people to not think about the specifics of what they're trying to stop and focus on there's a bigger, larger, more general principle here? Yeah, that's a that's a really good one. I think especially in countries that have historically been like part of Western democratic movement, we usually don't understand how quickly governments can change and how quickly things that are being used in theory for our good can be turned against us. Um, if you talk to people out of like the um, the Eastern European part of the world, when you talk to people who have suffered under like the Soviet regime, under the KGB, they understand that governments can quickly turn, that they can have quick overthrows and their privacy, their freedoms can collapse. So when we look at things like in the US, and I think this is a rampant thing, People cheer on when their political party gains power, expands their tools, expands their surveillance, expands their control over financial transactions, expands their control over personal freedoms. 
And they cheer those things on then because their political party is in power. But what they don't realize is that often both parties are working in tandem and they just hand those powers off to the next party that takes over. Things vacillate back and forth. And ultimately the people that you view as the enemy, maybe they are, maybe they aren't your enemy, but you view as the enemy, they end up having the same tools that you wanted your friends to have. And they end up using those against you, against the causes that you think are valuable. Um, So a lot of it is really just stepping back, kind of breaking out of the the political flames that are stoked and starting to take a bigger picture at what will these things, what will these changes do to society at a broader level? How will the implementation of these surveillance laws, how will the, the implications of this $600 reporting law by the IRS, how will the implications of uh, central bank digital currencies play out in the long run? And how will they affect both me and maybe the people that I don't care about or I don't want to see succeed or I don't want to be able to do things in the short term and the long term and really taking a longer term view of things and and understanding that if something is being used to benefit you right now, it's probably going to come back to bite you in the future. Um, And that historically has been the case and that that will sadly be the case in many countries in the future. Um, So a lot of it is just kind of taking a, a step back and looking at the overall picture and starting to understand that if we erode these freedoms for others, those freedoms will eventually erode for us and society as a whole will suffer. Uh, The great answer. I'll just follow up and say that, um, you know, I also always alert people because you'd be amazed. Some people don't know this, but um, the right to privacy is in the 1948 UN Declaration of Human Rights. It specifically was established after World War II as a fundamental right because not having any privacy uh, led to a lot of the horrific abuses in that war. And the founders of the UN understood that, actually, that you need privacy if you want to actually have some rights. Um, We're almost out of time. Um, I had one final question that um, I wanted to ask that nobody had asked yet, um, just because it's, once again, me trying to look into the future. Um, And this may be a silly question, depending on the technicals, but I figured I wanted to ask it anyway, which is, um, like so many things (laughs) in our digital world that depend on proper uh, working encryption to function, is Monero's protocols, would they be able to withstand or not eventually a quantum computer running Shor's algorithm or not? I mean, has the Monero community been thinking about this 10-year roadmap of not if, but when that starts happening? Yeah, so that, it's a really good question. Um, quantum computing has been a, a big dis- topic of discussion in a lot of the privacy space. Uh, within Monero, it's actually something that we've commissioned research around to start to understand what aspects of our transactional protocol would have issues uh, in this quantum um, theoretical future. Uh, The quick summary is that there would be lots of problems with tracing, uh, specifically with uh, the way that addresses are done and the way that ring signatures are done. It's possible that those could be broken and that the the true input and addresses could be linked together. The way that uh, amounts are hidden cryptographically, they're what's called perfectly hiding instead of perfectly binding. So with a quantum computer break, they couldn't see the amounts in transactions, but what they could do is just print Monero uh, infinitely. So obviously that's not ideal either. Um, it's something where as necessary, we will and are, are happy to change the protocol to um, resolve those problems. The, the main issue is that right now quantum resistant cryptography is very computationally expensive and very large. And when you're talking about something that's a blockchain and not just like a, a messaging protocol, you have to store all this information forever. So if you implement a cryptographic protocol that is quantum resistant today, which in some some ways would be a good idea, because if we do have this quantum breakthrough and there are quantum computers that can run Shor's algorithm, they can go back and break historical data on the blockchain. But if we implemented that today, the ability for someone to run a node, the ability for the the network to remain decentralized, um, the ability to use like mobile wallets would be drastically hampered. Um, So it's really kind of, trying to play a game where we make Monero as useful as possible right now while keeping an eye on what's happening um, and knowing that we don't want to sacrifice the usability of the network now for a potential future, but we also don't want to put people now in harm's way for a future that, again, is potential. It could happen. We could have this breakthrough. Um, So it's definitely something where there is continued research. Uh, We have research around specifically what the implications would be um, which I can provide a link to as well. But um, it, it is a concern. It's going to be a concern for basically every cryptographic algorithm out there. Um, most are 
not resistant to quantum computers. Um, some are, of course, there's lots of new cryptography happening around that. Uh, it's very important. But if there are breakthrough, breakthroughs that make it at least almost as efficient as current non-quantum resistant cryptography that's used in Monero, it would absolutely be implemented. And, and one of the beautiful things with Monero is we are open to change. We're open to hard forks that implement these things in a, a sane and secure and well-tested and, and well-vetted way. Um, so if the need arises, we'll do that. But, but yeah, right now, unfortunately, the algorithms are just way too inefficient to, to use within Monero. And I know I said that was going to be the last one, but I got one final one because I missed somebody to ask one online. Um, sort of going back a bit to where asking about uh, the best way to do Monero mining. I know we touched on a little bit AMD versus Intel, but I guess um, somebody wanted to know, um, are there advantages or disadvantages to using ARM architecture? Yeah, so if I recall correctly, ARM is extremely efficient. Um, and in some cases, like specifically the Apple chips, the M1 and M2 are, are extremely efficient at mining. There's some complications with the way that they actually implement things uh, on the chip. So I know that there were some issues previously with mining. I think those have all been hashed out, if you will. Um, but ARM generally is the most efficient way to mine Monero. Um, the problem is that Generally, ARM-based computers are very low powered. And so while they're efficient, you're not going to get that much over the long run unless you have lots of them. Um, but with with Apple's breakthroughs in ARM and I think the coming kind of storm of, of ARM desktops, um, they will probably be one of the best solutions for, for mining Monero because um, their architecture is actually extremely efficient. You can mine Monero on your phone as well. Obviously, there are downsides. You don't want to do it when you're on battery, that kind of thing. Um, but it is very efficient to, to mine on like Android devices as well. Very good. And with that, it's 10 till, and I promise Cat Factory we won't be uh, in the room too late. So I think I'm going to say that's it for questions. And I want us all to give Seth a huge uh, round of applause. I really, really <laughs> Seth, do you have any uh, parting words for us before we uh, let you go here? I don't think so. Just uh, thank you all for attending. Um, thank you all, like I said at the beginning, for being a part of a local community. I mean, th this is this is how we win. Uh, it's it's not ultimately through the tools. It's about the community, and the community is how tools improve. The community has people is how people learn to use the tools. Um, so, getting plugged in at things like EFF Austin are are so so vital. Um, so thank you for taking the time taking the effort to, to come to these things and to help to grow these communities. Um, but then just thank you all for attending. Hopefully this was informative and helpful. Um, my contact, contact info was in that that last slide, so hopefully you grabbed it if you need it. Um, but I'm happy to, to chat with any of you directly as well with, with more questions. Um, but thank you all for coming. Hope you all uh, learned something here, or able to, to, to know a little bit more about how Monero can be a tool for financial freedom, and uh, hope you all have a great rest of your week. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and if anybody who uh, parked in the garage, I have a parking validation slip that you can use. Um, you need to leave before 10 p.m. if you don't want to get charged the money, which is a lot. Um, so I encourage you to get out before then. Um, if you can stick around a little bit, we'll probably go over to the uh, lobby bar and have some drinks and chat for a bit. So if you want to hang around and socialize, we encourage you to do so. Um, thank you all for coming and happy to learn the Monero Group's a thing. Uh, I'm glad to meet all of you. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for organizing this whole thing. I know the woman era group is very thankful. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap for us. Uh, privacy. Uh, I don't know if you.